The manhua starts with our female lead walking down the aisle. She looks at the flowers, but her mind drifts to the people in the room. Half of them are gangsters, and the other half are just pretending to be noble. She then focuses on the hand holding hers, thinking about how it's the same hand that hurt her mom and herself. She grips it tightly, making her father uncomfortable. She thinks to herself that she chose marriage over not existing at all. At least it's only for three years, and then she can endure it. Hai Jin walks into Peace Pharmacy, ready to start her day. She puts on her lab coat and gets everything set up. Miss Lee comes in and after they greet each other, Miss Lee starts talking about a guy she saw in front of the elevator while parking her car. She describes him as looking like a gangster. To her, he seemed kind of cool, but also really scary. She felt like her life might be in danger if he decided to hit her. Just then, the same guy walks in and heads straight to Hai Jin's desk. He says something about her having a nice place to hide. Hai Jin tells him to come back later because she's busy working, but he grabs her by the hair and doesn't listen to her when she tells him to let go. He asks if she's going to run away again. Miss Lee tells him to let go or she'll report him, but he insists she put down her phone or he'll break her fingers. Scared, Miss Lee quickly puts her phone down. He then introduces himself as Hai Jin's older brother and says he's just talking to his sister, so Miss Lee doesn't need to worry about them. He adds that if she wants to shut down her business, she should just report him. Hai Jin tells Miss Lee that she's fine and will be back soon, and then she leaves with her brother. Outside the pharmacy, Hai Jin's brother is still holding her hair tightly. She scratches his wrist to try to get him to let go. As he raises his hand to hit her, she grabs his bleeding wrist and tells him he hasn't changed at all. He still doesn't respect women. He responds by throwing insults at her. When her brother confronts her about abandoning their family, Hai Jin asks him to be clear about what he wants. He says he needs her help, but she tells him to get out of her face if he's just going to talk nonsense. She thinks to herself that if he keeps this up, everyone, including their mom and dad, might be in danger. Hai Jin hasn't been in touch with her family for nine years, ever since she started college. She decided to leave behind the gangster world and focus on finding herself. It hasn't been easy, but she has managed to endure it. Her grandfather was well known across the country. Back then, one of his colleagues bought a piece of land with plans for construction. He asked Hai Jin's grandfather for help. After buying the land and building on it, the colleague kicked out all the hard-working laborers. Essentially, he was a gangster who worked in the service industry. Hai Jin's father was different from her grandfather. Instead of staying in the same line of work, he chose to jump into the construction industry. He was tired of being just a small player for MK Construction and wanted something more. He made a name for himself and started his own company, which he named Gang Han Construction. This new company did really well, just like MK Construction. Both companies grew into big, successful businesses, but at their core, they were still part of the same gangster world, just dressed up as corporate firms. Over the years, MK Construction and Gang Han Construction often clashed over the same pieces of land. Their disputes turned into fierce battles that resulted in many lives being lost. This violent conflict became a major story in the news and was talked about by society for a long time. For more than 20 years, they managed to keep their rivalry under control, which helped keep the situation relatively stable. They never developed a close relationship, but they maintained their separate territories. However, things changed when a new organization entered the scene. This new construction company, supported by foreign investors, started to push into the territories of both MK Construction and Gang Han Construction. Their arrival disrupted the long-standing rivalry and created new challenges for both companies. To prevent the situation from getting worse, the leaders of MK Construction and Gang Han Construction decided to join forces. They threatened each other and agreed to form an alliance through a marriage between their son and daughter. The deal was that neither side would show any violence during the marriage 
and that both families would work together to get rid of the new construction company. They also promised to maintain their alliance throughout the marriage. Hai Jin's mother begs her to endure the situation, saying that if she can just put up with it for three years, it will be worth it. Hai Jin thinks to herself that it's just a marriage, and there's no need to cry about it. Her brother then says that marriage isn't a big deal, and that she can marry a normal guy when she's older. He agrees with their dad and questions why she's making a fuss. Every time Hai Jin thinks about her father, she clenches her fists. She grits her teeth whenever she hears her brother's nonsense and calls herself a fool for coming back to this difficult situation. She wonders when she'll get to meet the groom. When they arrive at the Grand Hotel, Kim Mugang introduces himself and extends his hand for a handshake. Hai Jin thinks this is a bad impression and walks past him, introducing herself as well. He then pulls out a chair for her to sit, but she sees it as just a gangster's fake attempt at being polite. As they sit next to each other, Hai Jin asks about his brother, Mr. Kim Man Su. He questions why she wants to know, and she simply says it's okay. Kim Mu Gang then asks what she thinks about the wedding being held at the Grand Hotel where they are sitting. Hai Jin hopes her opinion doesn't cause any problems and replies that it doesn't matter. He praises her for having a good personality since she isn't bothered by the venue. During their conversation, Hai Jin mentions that she's the kind of person who can cut ties with her family. Kim Mu Gang responds that a woman like a sword is attractive, but she retorts that a man who says that in front of a woman isn't very appealing. Kim Mu Gang sees Hai Jin as someone who fits him well. He says she's respectful, but also a bit distant. Hai Jin tells him to stop talking nonsense. When he mentions that he's two years younger than her, he reassures her that he will stay polite. He then asks if it's okay for him to call her by her name, and she says it is. Laughing, he refers to himself as her groom. Hai Jin reminds him that they are not married yet, but he says there's only one week left and he's looking forward to it. Knowing that gangsters usually dislike women like her, she intentionally says unlucky things, pretending to feel bad, but he just keeps laughing. While she's lost in her thoughts, he asks her if she's good in bed. After a moment of silence, she finally admits that she hates boring relationships between men and women. Kim Mu Gang says he wants to get to know her slowly and listens to what his future wife has to say. He stands up and extends his hand, asking if they can leave. Hai Jin tells him that her family mentioned he's a good person. She thinks to herself that he must be a considerate person who accepts unreasonable suggestions from others. Still holding out his hand, Kim Mu Gang asks if she's ever thought a man could be intimate with a woman he can't even hold hands with. Hai Jin can't deny it and adds that she doesn't want him to dislike her actions. He asks why he should accept this, and she doesn't have an answer. Hai Jin wants to hear everything from the person who will be her husband. When he asks if she's good in bed, she wants to show him right then and there how well she can do. However, he tells her not to worry about it. Hai Jin concludes that Kim Mu Gang is dangerous and different from her father and brother. Even though he is smiling, he has a somewhat dangerous aura. She realizes she was rude and acknowledges it in her thoughts. Hai Jin forgets that they are both in the same situation. She's been acting like she's the only victim forced into this marriage, and now she refers to him as a man who has been kind about her strange questions. She tells him that marrying a woman he doesn't love wouldn't have been as good as this situation. He responds by saying that he wasn't sold into the marriage, he chose to enter it willingly. Hai Jin realizes that her partner has changed just a day ago. Instead of the eldest, Kim Mansu, she now has his younger brother, Kim Mu Gang. She wasn't curious about it before, but now she wants to know why the change happened. He tells her she's asking too soon. Hai Jin wonders if they've met before. She remembers seeing him and notes that, even though he's not very tall, his presence is memorable. Kim Mu Gang moves closer and says he hopes she remembers him. She expected their meeting to be a formal and emotionless confrontation, but she finds it hard to hide her feelings. She feels overwhelmed by the man in front of her. 
The next day is the wedding, and the bride's face looks far from happy. Even though she's wearing a stunning white wedding dress, she looks as depressed as a wilted lily. Both families have been busy preparing for the wedding all week. They've been coordinating guest lists to avoid inviting business partners who are enemies, checking the backgrounds of each other's bodyguards, and agreeing on what weapons to bring to the ceremony. As she tries on the wedding dress, Hai Jin wonders why any bride would be afraid of being attacked at her own wedding. When the dress announces that the bride is ready, she opens the curtain. Kim Mu Gang sees her and says she looks pretty, asking his guards for their opinion. They agree that she looks beautiful. With embarrassment all over her face, she decides to keep the wedding dress. When Kim Mu Gang asks if she wants to try on another dress, she tells him she likes this one. Then Kim Mu Gang asks what she thinks of his suit. Hai Jin tells him to do whatever he likes because she doesn't care. But he insists that he wants to wear clothes chosen by his future wife. He says the suit looks good on him. The dresser compliments them, saying they are the best couple she has ever seen and thanks them for their business. Hai Jin thinks to herself that it's all just about money. They walk into another store where the salesperson greets them and says the accessories are ready based on the brand design Hai Jin mentioned. She looks at some rings, and the salesperson asks if she likes them. Hai Jin says yes. Hai Jin used to enjoy this kind of wealth before she cut ties with her family. She lived in the most expensive apartment in Gangnam Yoke Land and had one of only three foreign cars in Korea. Her mother was Miss Korea, and her father believed the world ran on money and power, always insisting on only the finest things. Hai Jin was proud of owning it all. Kim Mu Gang then shows her a watch and asks if she likes it. Hai Jin wonders if it would be better suited as a necklace or earrings and confirms that it's fine. She isn't very impressed, feeling that everything seems excessive right now. While she's lost in her thoughts, Kim Mu Gang asks if she has a man in her life. Hai Jin answers yes. Noticing his reaction, she asks him if there's a problem. He questions if she's currently dating anyone, and she confirms again that she is. During her high school days, Hai Jin confessed her feelings to her senior, her first love. She told him she liked him, but he apologized, saying he wanted to focus on his studies. After that, she was ridiculed behind her back. People talked about her gangster family, saying she was creepy and that her brother would beat up anyone who got close to her. Her brother did end up beating up the boy, but not because of Hai Jin. It was because he had a problem that had been quiet for a while, and he said he felt an itch to use his fists. After that incident, no one wanted to make eye contact with Hai Jin, and her first love ended miserably. Even in college, the rumors didn't stop, and men quickly backed away from her. Kim Mu Gang asks if she is dating anyone else. Hai Jin tries to change the topic, reminding him they are there to choose a wedding ring. But Kim Mu Gang insists it's important to know before they get married. Hai Jin thinks that Kim Mu Gang is pretending to be gentle and friendly, but is showing his true colors now. She compares him to her father, who makes excuses for men and treats her mother poorly. She sees her father as a thug who tells women to be careful, but plays around with three women himself, just like her brother, who changes girlfriends whenever he wants. She asks Kim Mu Gang if he has a girlfriend. He says she is the only one he has. He then reminds her that their marriage is serious, not a game or a new romance. Hai Jin thinks to herself that she is risking her family's safety to fulfill this contract. Hai Jin warns Kim Mu Gang not to do anything stupid, like threatening or forcing her, because such actions won't affect her. Hearing this, he kneels in front of her, tells her she is appealing, and that she is his right choice. When she asks what he's talking about, he takes her hand and puts a ring on her finger. He says they should live well together and promises that he won't let a drop of water touch her hand. Hai Jin had once dreamed of getting a proposal from someone she loved, but she thought it was just a fantasy. She never imagined marriage would be part of her life. Yet here is Kim Mu Gang kneeling in front of her, with a shining ring on her finger and making a childish promise about not letting water touch her hand. 
but she doesn't respond to his proposal. The storm on the wedding day is huge and expected because it's monsoon season. For Hai Jin, the heavy rain symbolizes the relationship between the two gangster families, MK Construction and Gang Han Construction. Their relationship is full of conflict, like a battle that has turned the whole area into a sea of blood. The news of the union between the two families makes headlines that morning, and the newspaper even calls it a metaphor for gangster Romeo and Juliet. To Hai Jin, it feels like she is just an actor in a comedy play. Today is Hai Jin's wedding day. She is sitting on the couch in her wedding dress when someone knocks on the door. She tells them to come in. It's Kim Mu Gang. She asks him about his bodyguards, and he says he sent them away. Then he asks her how many children they should have and how often they should be intimate. Hai Jin thinks it's not right to discuss such things through someone else but Kim Mu Gang doesn't mind. In her mind, Hai Jin knows that she isn't interested in a long-term relationship or anniversaries because she plans to end the marriage as soon as the three years are up. She wonders if Kim Mu Gang has unrealistic expectations. He says that since it's their wedding, they need to plan things for themselves. But Hai Jin sees this as just an arranged marriage where they live together. He asks if she snores at night, and she tells him not to ask. He says he sleeps well even if it's noisy. Hai Jin mentions that she doesn't like sharing a bed with other people, but Kim Mu Gang says it's important for couples to sleep in the same bed, even if they argue. Hai Jin asks who made the rule about couples sleeping in the same bed. Kim Mu Gang says it was their parents. Hai Jin replies that their parents' situation is different from theirs because their marriage wasn't arranged by a contract. Kim Mu Gang tries to convince her that there's no difference between their marriage and their parents' marriages. Hai Jin explains that their parents met and decided to marry, while they knew they were going to get married before even meeting each other. Kim Mu Gang then comments on how attractive her mouth is when she uses the word we, and Hai Jin looks at him in surprise. Although she finds Kim Mu Gang different from her brother, she still doesn't trust his smiling face. She tells him that she can't sleep with other people, but warns him not to touch her in any unwanted way. He assures her that he won't touch her unless she really wants him to and adds that such a condition can't be put into a contract because they are a couple. Hai Jin replies that it can be addressed with words. Kim Mu Gang asks if she thinks he would hit her. She says there shouldn't be any swearing or violence, but he responds that one can't predict the future. Her thoughts turn to her parents, and she feels a cloud of concern. Hai Jin remembers how her father used to deal with her mother. He would get angry and use excuses that didn't make sense. As a young girl, she would rush to protect her mother, but ended up getting hurt herself. She's not surprised by her brother's behavior since he grew up watching their father. She sees them both as thugs who use their fists before using words. Kim Mu Gang steps closer to her and wipes away her tears, saying he will never hurt her. His words seem sincere to her, and she thinks that even though she's not happy, being with him might not be such a bad thing. He tells her they can deal with everything later, and that it's never too late to make decisions in life. He adds that they will have plenty of time to spend together. The flowers at the wedding alone cost over 100 million. The banquet hall is packed with guests, half of whom are important figures and the other half are gangsters pretending to be high class. Hai Jin thinks about how strange it is that the same hand that hit her mother and herself is now holding hers as they walk down the wedding aisle. She tries not to think about it and focuses on the flowers. The whole thing feels surreal as she climbs up the stairs with Mu Gang's hand in hers. After a long ceremony, it's finally time for the vows. They exchange their vows and officially become a couple. When it's time to eat and drink, the atmosphere is lively and a bit chaotic. Hai Jin's father starts the conversation by saying Mu Gang doesn't look like anyone in his family, while Mu Gang's father remarks that the man who fathered his son-in-law must look like an old man. Hai Jin agrees with her father for the first time, noticing that Mu Gang's father's short stature and appearance don't seem to match Mu Gang at all. Instead, Mu Gang's older brother looks more like their father.
Mu Gang's father then makes a comment about whether an ignorant man gave birth to the same idiot, referring to Hai Jin's brother, and adds that he'll leave his daughter-in-law out of it. This upsets Hai Jin's father, and he becomes furious, raising his hand to hit her. Her mother steps in to stop him. Her father then questions why his wife would interfere with what he's doing, and her mother apologizes. After that, the argument between the families turns the whole event into a mess. During the argument, they fight over names, status, and appearances. Hai Jin tells her brother to keep his hands off her brother-in-law as they are getting into a fight. She offers Kim Man a sword, but Mu Gang stops her, saying it's their son's wedding. Kim Man apologizes as instructed by his father. Hai Jin notices that her father's expression shows he's unhappy with everything happening. She thinks about how her mother is like a trapped mouse when they get home, unable to speak due to her position. Hai Jin starts to wish the marriage would end after this sword fight. Even though she planned to stay for three years, she already feels like running away. Kim Mu Gang stands up, takes her hand, and announces that it's time for their flight. They start to leave the wedding venue. He tells her that Jeju Island will be fun and asks for her opinion on it. Their honeymoon destination is Jeju Island. Kim Mu Gang built a villa there with the first money he earned from his construction job. They walk onto a private plane, and as she sits down, she thinks about how her father, upset by the news, bought a private plane the following year. Already seated, Kim Mu Gang looks at her and asks if she is upset. She simply replies, no. She has a fear of heights, so she stays frozen in her seat until they arrive at Jeju Island. She asks if there are any family traditions they haven't talked about yet. Laughing, he says they need to get off the plane using parachutes. Then he asks if he can hug her, but she says no. Despite that, he takes her hand. Even though she didn't agree, she feels comfortable with his hand holding hers. Instead of pulling away, she lets him help her, as they hold hands tightly until the plane lands. As she tries to get off the plane, her leg hurts, and Kim Mu Gang offers to massage it. He even jokes that he could lick her toes, but she tells him not to touch her legs because they are dirty. She closes her eyes and lets him massage her leg. He tells her to sleep because there's a lot to do later. Hearing this, she quickly pulls her leg away, saying he shouldn't force her. As they step out, he puts his hand on her shoulder. He shows her the villa where they'll be staying and asks if she likes it. She walks away, saying she likes the wedding the most. Kim Mu Gang feels a bit embarrassed by her response. She thinks it's a nice cottage, but she feels it's a shame they are only staying for two days. She insists that two days is enough. They toast to their future, as Kim Mu suggests. While he means forever, she thinks their marriage will eventually end someday. As they walk along the shore, Kim Mu Gang keeps staring at her and says it's great to be alone together. She tells him not to do anything weird. He steps closer, faces her, and holds her face with both hands, asking what she's talking about. He moves in to kiss her, but she calls his name and pushes him away. He says she's being weak and that calling his name makes him remember he can't do what he wants. He adds that she has another chance to change her mind. Even though he stares at her intensely, he backs off. She then asks about the bodyguards, noting that they followed her while she was alone. Kim Mu Gang tells her to get used to it, even if she doesn't like it. When she says she can live on her own, Kim Mu Gang tells her he knows she's been happy for the past nine years and doubts she's really lived alone. She figures her father must have sent someone to follow her without her noticing. She realizes she was too naive not to see it and decides she needs to escape her current situation. Kim Mu Gang then tells her to stay by his side if she doesn't like it. She insists she knows how to protect herself, but he suddenly pulls her close, covering her mouth with his hand and lifting her off the ground. He asks what she would do if something like this happened to her. In response, she stomps on his leg hard and punches him in the chest. Standing upright, she mentions having seven packs, and holding his chest, he stumbles back and falls to his knees. 
Seeing him on the ground, she calls his name and moves closer to help him. But before she can reach him, he pulls her down onto his lap. She ends up sitting on his knees as he sits on the ground. He then asks if she doesn't know she shouldn't leave her enemy until the very end. She complains that his jokes are making her heart race. He laughs and apologizes, then wipes sand off his face. She points out a scar below his eye and asks about it. The scar makes him look less impressive. The thugs and his father thought of it as a badge of honor. He then asks if she remembers the day he wore a helmet, saying he was shorter than her back then. When she was in her second year of high school, she arrives out of breath from running. She calls her brother, Young Hyun, and tells him they should go back home. When he doesn't respond, she asks when he'll be home. It was the year she finished high school and became an adult. Her brother didn't go to college, instead, he just hung around asking strangers for money. In their house, if the oldest son isn't strong or responsible, their father blames their mother for not taking care of the family or teaching the kids properly. So she searches for him desperately, acting like someone who's lost their mind. When he tells her he'll come home when it's time, she explains that she's doing it for their mom. He asks if she can endure it for her, but she says she's out of money. When he demands the money she doesn't have, he gets angry and says he wouldn't have gotten anything even if she did. She moves closer and bites him hard on his lower leg. He screams as she keeps biting him, and when he raises his hand to hit her, someone kicks him from behind, making him fall on his back. She asks who the person is, since he's wearing a helmet. The person asks if she's okay and tells her to run while holding her hands. He explains that she needs to get her brother to go home. He walks over, grabs her brother, and hits his head against the wall. She begs him to stop, and just in time, a police car arrives. Her brother, Hyun, manages to escape. She helps the man up, asks if he's okay, thanks him for helping her, and tells him not to get involved in other people's problems. She's surprised to learn that he had a wound that day. He asks if it looks impressive, but she says she doesn't believe it. She remembers how skinny he was back then, and how his young voice disappeared. He feels it's a shame because he would have sought revenge before her brother became perfect. She asks how he plans to get his revenge, and he wonders if he should make her pay ten times for it. She thanks him, saying it's just words. She had thought the scar was from fighting, but now she realizes it saved her eleven years ago, and she feels guilty. Still touching the scar, he asks if they can stand up. He talks about being unsettled and alert, stretching out his hand and asking her to help him up, but she ignores him and walks away. She thinks about the scar on his face from getting involved in other people's problems, how he asked for help and she refused. She reflects on how cold she seems, not missing anyone and not caring about others' opinions, but she finds herself getting caught up in everything when she's with Kim Mu Gang. As he takes a warm bath, he thinks about what happened at the shore. Meanwhile, she opens a bottle of Hennessy in the sitting room. She's been feeling nervous about their wedding night and keeps thinking about how he tried to kiss her. That's why she asked to sleep in a separate room and set rules against physical contact. She knows he won't force her, but she wonders how long this will last. She remembers his comments about touching things that make someone feel lustful, how he sucked her leg when she was hurt, and his desire to kiss her. She knows he's different from her and isn't pretending to be just a couple, he really wants to be one. She takes a sip of her drink, concluding that this isn't how she feels. He walks into the sitting room and approaches where she's sitting. As she turns to face him, her eyes meet his broad chest, and she notices a leopard tattoo running from his shoulder to his navel. He takes the drink from her and asks why she's drinking alone. He says she should wait for him, then takes a sip himself. She thinks that all gangsters must have leopard tattoos like his. He asks if she wants to touch it, but when she reaches out, she pushes him away. He pulls her closer, and she asks why he isn't wearing a shirt. He teases her, asking if she wants to take it off herself, but she reminds him that they agreed to avoid physical contact. He tells her he'll make her want it. 
He holds her by the waist and neck and moves his face closer to hers. As they start kissing, her thoughts get cloudy. Her mind feels like it's going to explode, and her legs go weak from feelings she's never felt before. She begs him to stop, wipes her lips, and wonders what kind of situation she's in. She thinks he's only focused on overpowering her and sees him as a dangerous man, almost like a wild animal. She thinks her first kiss was a mess. She reminds him again that they agreed not to have any physical contact. He asks if she's in a bad mood, and when she asks why he's asking, he says he loved it and was about to lose control. She throws a piece of clothing at him, and he adds that there's no way to explain it better. She wonders how it would feel if it were his body instead, because just a touch on his lips feels nice. He tells her he can't get a grip on himself, but still wants to go all the way with her because it's all he thinks about when they are together. His words are so direct that she wonders if she heard him right. She finds it ridiculous and thinks that if another woman were in her place, he'd probably say the same thing. He rests his head on her shoulder and apologizes for kissing her without asking. She reminds him that he always does what he feels like doing. He says he only wanted to sleep with her and that's why he made her feel nervous, but he doesn't regret it because he's dreamed about that moment. He also says it feels even better than he imagined. She wonders why Kim Moo says he enjoyed the kiss, and she admits that she enjoyed it a lot too. She had thought he didn't like it. He says he can't promise he won't touch her fingers, but he won't force her. If he can't resist the urge, he'll ask for her permission and try his best to make her feel the same way. She says she'll be upset and doesn't want to do anything. She is actually speechless because of his touch. She wonders if he's found her weak spot again and if she's being pulled into his emotions. Still holding her fingers, he begs her not to push him away. She asks if he will listen to her from now on. When he says he will, she tells him to put his shirt on, and he does as she says. Kim Moo sleeps on the couch while Hai Jin lies in bed. After a loud flash of lightning, she checks her phone and sees that it's half past four. She slept longer than she expected. She tells Kim Moo to move to the sofa in the living room. He tries to persuade her by saying they'll only hold hands while they sleep but she reminds him of his promise to always listen to her. She adds that if he doesn't, she'll sleep on the sofa instead. As he leaves, he says he won't bother her anymore that day because she might get tired. From the wedding ceremony to the honeymoon, there has been a lot of emotional tension between them. As she thinks about what happened in the living room, she feels relieved that she asked him to leave. He asks if she is asleep, and when she turns to face him, he says he came in because he's afraid of the lightning. He says he came in because he's scared of lightning, and she agrees to let him stay just for tonight. She asks if he knows his face looks scary, and he responds with a surprised, really. He then asks if he can hold her hand, calling her thick-skinned in a teasing way. She complains about the constant rain, and he wonders if she has somewhere to go once it stops. She says no and mentions that she likes staying in the villa all day. He then jokes about being hurt because she said she's most satisfied just staying in the villa. She laughs and agrees that staying home all day in Jeju Island seems like a waste. When he suggests they visit a place he mentioned before, a farm nearby where he received a gift called Huangtu when he was 14, she can't remember him talking about it earlier. Huangtu is his oldest friend, and he really wants to see him. He adds that Huangtu is his wife which she finds both embarrassing and wonderful. She thinks to herself that she won't pay much attention to Kim Moo Gang's sweet talk until she understands what marriage really means. To her, it feels like just a political marriage, and she worries that if there's no benefit, they might break up. She wonders why he is so clear, simple, and confident, and why he calls Huang to his wife even with their kind of relationship. That night, she falls asleep without realizing it and dreams of a big panther. It has fierce golden eyes and a golden coat. She feels comfortable listening to its heartbeat and snuggles into its warm, soft chest. In the morning, Kim Moo is in the kitchen making breakfast. He asks Hai Jin if she prefers milk or soy milk, 
and if she likes her eggs fully cooked or semi-cooked. She tells him she likes soy milk and semi-cooked eggs. She mentions that it has been a long time since she had breakfast with someone. After taking a bite, she says it isn't as bad as she thought, and he tells her it's not just not bad, but actually delicious. Kim Mu explains how nice it is for her to live with him. He says that if there's thunder in the morning, he'll be right by her side, letting her rest her head on his arm and her leg on his waist. She then tells him that she thought he was like a doll. Outside the villa on a very sunny day, Kim Mu takes pictures of her, but she asks him to stop. When they arrive at their destination, Kim Mu introduces her to Huang Tu. He pats Huang Tu on the face and tells her that this is his wife, making the introduction casual and light. Hai Jin doesn't know much about horses, but she can tell that Huang Tu is beautiful. She thinks Huang Tu looks like Kim Mu because it seems like a wild animal. Kim Mu takes a photo of her, as she puts her head close to Huang Tu's mouth. He watches her play with the horse and then tells her that he's never seen her smile so genuinely before. When she asks if there are fake smiles, he explains that there are teasing smiles, empty smiles, and smirks. He adds that she usually doesn't have any reason to smile like that. Even though leaving her stifling home to be alone was comfortable and freeing, she struggles to make it through a day. Kim Mu promises to make her smile more often from now on and to put a ring on her finger. She says that the only reason she smiled after hearing that was because of the beautiful weather. The three days and two nights of their honeymoon go by quickly. On the plane, Hai Jin sips her tea. She no longer has time to feel afraid of flying. She reflects on how the trip was happy, the last flight was uneventful, and the peaceful time during the storm. She feels comfortable now, even though she thinks the next destination seems disgusting and gloomy. When they arrive, her mother welcomes her new son-in-law, Kim Mu, while he greets her father and mother-in-law. Her dad asks if they are back. Hai Jin is upset by the way her dad is treating Kim Mu. Kim Mu bows deeply and asks her dad to accept his respect. Her dad agrees, but Hai Jin wonders why Kim Mu is bowing so much, thinking it's not normal. She is frustrated that her dad sold her off just to keep his gang. Her brother walks in and suggests that she should also bow to greet their dad. He questions where she's been and why she's making fun of their father. He sits down and keeps insisting that Hai Jin should bow, saying Kim Mu doesn't need to worry about her. He adds that it's enough to wish for a long life just to see her bowing. Even though she never wanted to be there because of her biological parents, she feels surprisingly calm at the moment. Annoyed, she tightly squeezes her palm. Kim Mu decides to bow twice on her behalf. This makes her brother and father upset, and Hai Jin is surprised by their reaction. Kim Mu decides to bow twice for her, saying dear dad and wishing him a long life. Her dad then questions if she's crazy and wonders why anyone would need her. Hai Jin is puzzled about why Kim Mu is matching her stubbornness. Kim Mu explains that being a couple means sticking together through everything, even if it's tough. He says he will always support her and won't force her to do anything she doesn't want to do. He also promises that no one else will force her to do something she doesn't want to do, and that they will be happy together. This is the first time she's seen him do this, and it makes her father's face turn red with anger. Her brother sighs beside her, and her mother just watches the scene, unable to close her mouth. It feels like a familiar situation. Kim Mu calls her over and stretches out his hand. She places hers in his, feeling that it's the first time someone is really on her side and giving her a voice in this house. Holding her hand, they leave her family's house and head to his home. His mom and dad greet her with smiles. His mom asks if the trip was fun, and she says yes. Even though she still feels a bit stressed in her new home, everything goes smoothly. At dinner, she sees the food and knows that his mom must have been a bit worried because of her arrival. His father wants to start a conversation, but his mom suggests he wait because their daughter-in-law must be tired. She adds that Hai Jin should just be herself. Hai Jin feels that the warm welcome at Kim Mu's house is a bit strange but comforting. She thinks about how boring and sad mealtimes were with her family, 
compared to the warmth and love she feels at Kim Moo's house. She hopes that one day this warmth will be her new reality and wishes she could get used to it. Feeling very tired, she asks if she can go home now. As they leave Kim Moo's family's house, she asks if they can go home. When he asks if she means his home, she says she isn't ready to live with someone else yet. Even though he's a good man and very romantic, she finds it hard to live together since they just got married recently. She explains that she doesn't hate the idea of living with him, but she's sorry and needs time to adjust. Her workplace is in Gyeonggi, so commuting is also a bit of a problem. He reminds her of his promise not to force her to do anything she doesn't want to and agrees to take her home. However, she asks if he can stay with her for the weekend at her place. He accepts defeat again, even though he still looks a bit angry. From the balcony, she waves at him and tells him to hurry back. He winks at her and blows her kisses, making her laugh. As she looks at the full moon, she thinks about how beautiful the night is. Back in the shop, she feels a bit excited, but she isn't sure if it's just because it's been a while since she's been at work. What's really on her mind is the image of Kim Moo Kang from yesterday. She keeps thinking about how his eyes shone brightly, like street lamps, and how he shaped his mouth to say good night. Dr. Lee walks in with a happy face and is pleased to see Dr. Hai Jin. She asks about the trip, and Hai Jin tells her that it was very enjoyable. Dr. Lee is glad to see her, and says she looks even more beautiful than before. She asks if Hai Jin is really okay, even though she doesn't seem too bad. Dr. Lee brings up how her brother mentioned the sudden marriage a few days ago, and how surprised she was since Hai Jin hadn't been seeing anyone before. She wonders why she didn't get an invitation to the wedding. Hai Jin explains that she was worried whether it was really a marriage and apologizes for making Dr. Lee worry. She adds that she didn't send an invite because only close relatives were invited to the ceremony. Dr. Lee then comments that Hai Jin looks much better now, so she should be able to relax. She really wants to keep her life a bit normal, but to do that, she feels she'll need to lie more. She feels overwhelmed because things have been so busy. As she walks home, she remembers the texts from Dr. Lee asking when she would be back while she was on her honeymoon. Dr. Lee mentioned that Hai Jin must have been very tired being alone. She checks her phone but sees there are no calls or texts from Kim Moo Kang, and she's confused about who keeps asking her to come back to their house. As she walks home, she notices someone following her. She wonders if it's Kim Moo's bodyguard or someone sent by her family. She decides to walk faster, even though she knows the person could have hurt her if that was their intention. Still, she feels uneasy. When she gets close to her building, she sees light coming from her room window. She takes a deep breath and quietly opens the door. Inside, someone asks if she's back home and tells her to come in, saying she must be tired. She moves closer quickly and hits him on the neck. He falls to the ground, and she stays in position, holding him down. She asks who he is, and he calls her name. She realizes it's Kim Moo. She then questions how he got in, and if he had his men force her door open. She reminds him of his promise not to do things she doesn't like and asks if those were just empty words. He stays silent, so she decides to leave. He grabs her hand and says a thief broke into her house. He suggests they have dinner first before he explains what happened. While preparing dinner, he tells her that he got a message and his driver suggested they go to her house because they heard about the break-in. When they arrived, he showed the police his passport and their wedding photos to prove he's her husband. After getting inside, he checked around and figured the thief must have targeted her because they thought someone lived there. He says it seems like a warning that someone could break in at any time to threaten her. He adds that he cleaned up her house and is making dinner now. Looking at the plate of food, she asks how he got it. He says he bought it at the market because presentation is really important when cooking. She takes a bite of the noodles, then apologizes. He asks if the food is bad or if she just doesn't like Italian food, and says he can make soy sauce for her. 
She explains that her apology was for getting angry earlier, and he tells her that's understandable. He admits he should have told her about the thief earlier because he didn't want to scare her, and he apologizes for not letting her know sooner. While doing the dishes, he asks if anything was stolen. She says there's nothing worth stealing in her house. He then asks if she saw any strangers around her office while she was coming and going. He asks if she noticed anyone suspicious in town while she was at the office. She says she didn't, but she did notice someone following her on her way to work and back. She turned around but didn't see anyone. He then reveals that those people were his and he told them to follow her without being seen so she wouldn't be bothered. He adds that, given what happened today, he will replace all of his people. She tells him it's not necessary. She explains that having a bodyguard might mean the thief wasn't just after stealing something, but that it could be something more serious. He agrees that it is possible. Kim asks if they can go to bed, and she tells him the bed isn't very big. He quickly says he'll stay outside instead. He explains that he can't just leave her alone because someone broke into her house so quickly, and they might still be around. Also, if he went home in this situation, he wouldn't be able to sleep. As he grabs his shirt from the wardrobe, she asks if he really plans to stay outside her house. He says yes and that he'll park somewhere she can see from the window. Before he leaves, he tells her to call him if she feels scared. But then she calls him back and tells him to stay the night at her place. In the bathroom, she thinks to herself that she could handle a thief, but if the intruder was a gangster, it would be too much for her to handle. Thinking about Kim staying outside for so long makes her feel a bit awkward, especially since she's staying in this house for the next four years. While she's thinking, she hears him knock on the bathroom door. He tells her he needs to go out for a minute to buy some underwear and clothes to change into. He also says she shouldn't be scared while he's gone. She feels anxious because she can't tease him about it, and she thinks he must be doing this so she won't feel uncomfortable. She finds him stubborn, but also really dedicated to small details. It seems a bit funny, but being with him makes her feel safe. He comes back soon after she finishes, changes into his new clothes and underwear, and jumps on the bed. She tells him to make use of it. He says he wants to kiss her, but she tells him to be quiet. He keeps going, saying the way she says his name sounds so appealing. She asks him why he didn't refuse when she offered him the bed, wondering if he likes it that much. He admits that he does, and he loves her scent too. Then he asks if she wants to join him on the bed, but quickly says he was just kidding and that she should sleep. She lies on a cloth on the floor and says she'll add some extra security to the front door tomorrow. For now, he just needs to keep watch for the night. He touches her forehead and asks if she's worried about him. He tells her not to be, saying he has everything planned out. When she asks what his plan is, he covers her face with his fingers and tells her to go to sleep since she needs to wake up early. The police ask if he's really young Hai Jin's husband and why she's living there alone. He checks his ID and confirms he is her husband. Kim Mu says they will be reunited soon and looks upstairs. He turns out to be even more stubborn and unreasonable than she had expected. As they walk, Mr. Kim Mu Gang offers to take her home, which she finds surprising. She asks if he's not going to the company today. He casually replies that he's still on vacation after getting married and adds that it's nice being a CEO with a bit of free time. He even offers to carry her bag, saying it's no trouble at all. She laughs and teases him, saying that as an ordinary worker, it's a little annoying to see a CEO act so casually. This makes him chuckle, clearly enjoying the playful banter. Despite the light-hearted moment, the ordinary day feels different now. The usually quiet road she walks alone on feels strange with him walking beside her. The presence of someone else changes her familiar routine, making it seem unusual and a bit unsettling. When they finally arrive at the office building, she turns to him with a sense of urgency and asks him to go home. She's puzzled by his stubbornness and questions why he insists on staying with her. 
He gives her a reassuring smile and says he just wants to make sure she gets inside safely before he leaves. His insistence makes the situation even more unusual, and she has to accept that for now, this ordinary day has turned into something quite different with him by her side. He responds with a gentle smile, saying he just wants to see her safely inside before he goes. He reassures her that he won't be in the way. With that, they both enter the building together. As they walk in, she greets Dr. Lee, who is busy at her desk. She leans in close to Dr. Lee, whispering with a touch of curiosity, I think I've seen him before. Do you know if he's your boyfriend? Before Dr. Lee can respond, Kim steps forward and, with a friendly but firm gesture, says, he's not just a boyfriend. He's my husband. He then pulls her closer to him in a warm embrace. Dr. Lee looks surprised but then smiles, inviting Kim to come in and have a cup of coffee before he leaves. She adds with a hint of relief, I was a bit anxious about getting married so quickly. But I have to admit, I didn't expect my husband to be this handsome. She chuckles softly, feeling a bit more at ease now that Kim is here. He thanks her as he takes the coffee, and she immediately starts asking him questions. She wants to know what he does for a living, why he's not at work today, and if his house is close by. As she's asking these questions, her phone rings, it's Hai Jin calling. She feels a bit uneasy, wondering if she's asked too many questions too quickly. He reassures her that it's perfectly fine and actually tells her he's grateful that his wife has such a considerate colleague. She mentions that she thinks his wife is a really special person, and he agrees, saying he's always thankful for her. Curious, she then asks how he and Hai Jin met. He smiles and shares that Hai Jin was his first love. He explains that Hai Jin and her father came to his grandfather's funeral many years ago. He was struck by how impressive she was even back then. Hai Jin is in high school when it all happens. One day, he begins to tell the story of a time when a man died, and it led to a huge fight among the adults. He talks about how everyone started arguing, and how things quickly got out of hand. He remembers the shouting, the anger, and the tension in the air. In the middle of all the chaos, he spots her. She stands out to him, even though everything around them is so chaotic. He describes her eyes as bright and full of emotion, like they could see right through him. Her voice is soft but strong, and even with all the noise, he can hear her clearly. At that moment, he doesn't know it yet, but looking back now, he realizes it was love at first sight. As time goes by, the girl he saw that day becomes someone he can't forget. Every time he thinks about that day, her face is the first thing that comes to mind. She becomes special to him in a way he never expected. At first, Hai Jin can't recall all the details of that day. The memory is a bit blurry because so much is happening all at once. But as he continues talking about it, the memories come back to him more clearly. He remembers the sounds, the smells, and the feelings of that chaotic day. He remembers the man who died, the fight that broke out, and most importantly, he remembers her. The more he talks about it, the more vivid the memories become, and he can see everything as if it's happening all over again. He realizes that even though it was a difficult and frightening day, meeting her made it unforgettable in a completely different way. She brought a sense of calm and hope amidst the chaos, and that's something he holds on to. As he shares his story, he understands how deeply she has impacted him, and how that moment has stayed with him all these years. Even though they were surrounded by turmoil, seeing her was like finding a light in the darkness, and it's a memory that remains etched in his heart. There's a knock on the door, and Dr. Lee welcomes the customer inside. Kim Mu says goodbye to Hai Jin, telling her that he will come to pick her up later. Hai Jin watches him leave, feeling a bit uneasy but trying to focus on her day. As Dr. Lee attends to the customer, giving her some medicine and chatting with her, a memory suddenly comes to Hai Jin's mind. It's like a scene from a movie playing in her head, so vivid and clear. She remembers it was the funeral of a gangster, a day that should have been about mourning and paying respects. Instead, out of nowhere, a big argument starts. 
The tension in the room rises quickly, and voices get louder. People start shouting, and before anyone can stop it, the argument turns into a violent fight. The memory of that day is sharp and detailed. Hai Jin recalls how the funeral floor becomes a mess, with chairs overturned and people shoving each other. Blood is everywhere. She can see it clearly in her mind's eye, the red standing out starkly against the dull colors of the funeral setting. Someone even gets cut with a blade, and the sight of all that blood makes her stomach turn. The chaos of that day, the screams, the sound of fists hitting flesh, and the sight of people she knew turning on each other, it all makes a deep impression on her. Hai Jin's feelings about gangsters changed dramatically after that day. The sight of the violence and the blood makes her hate gangsters even more. She can't understand why they have to bring their fights and anger into such a solemn occasion. As she stands there in Dr. Lee's office, the memory is so strong that it feels like she is back at that funeral. She can almost hear the shouts and feel the fear she felt then. The whole place feels like a nightmare, and the memory of it is still very vivid in her mind. The scene is so intense that it leaves a lasting impression on her, making her feel a deep sense of anger and hatred toward the gangsters who caused all the trouble. In the evening, just as he promised in the morning, Kim comes to pick Hai Jin up. He takes her hand and suggests they go out for dinner. As they walk, she starts to wonder how much he really understands her. She also questions herself, wondering how well she understands him. When they arrive at the restaurant, they sit next to each other. Kim talks about how well she's eating and mentions again how beautiful she is. When they get to her place, she reminds him of what she said earlier about him dropping her off in front and then leaving. But Kim insists he needs to see her go into her room to feel all right. She brings up the fact that his bodyguards follow her everywhere, and he laughs it off. She thanks him for the day, saying he should go home as she opens her door, and firmly tells him that he can't stay at her place for the night. Kim says good night, but she can't shake the feeling that something is wrong. The previous day, Kim insisted on guarding the front of the house. Now, as she stands there staring at him, he opens the door to the room opposite hers. She asks him what he's doing, but he doesn't answer her question. Instead, he just walks into the opposite room, saying he'll see her in the morning. She watches him go, feeling a mix of confusion and curiosity about why he's staying so close by. Despite her questions, he seems determined to keep an eye on her, making her wonder what exactly is going on and why he feels the need to be so protective. As she goes into her own room, she can't help but think about his actions and what they might mean. If you're eager for the next chapter, drop a comment expressing your interest in a part 2. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated. Until next time, ciao.